And he said something to the effect of, if anyone's going to ruin this town forever, I want it to be you. <laughs> so go to this casting call. I want it to be Nitro. Yeah. You only have to be a little smart to overcome a mullet. How do you even start a drink company? I should know. Ryan gave me some great advice very early on. I did. Average American's caloric intake is 20% alcohol. Oh, whoa. The product has to stand by itself. Sure. Yeah. Like you can't put something out there and get your fans to buy it once and it sucks and they never buy it again. You need to transcend the product. You have a team. Two of them are dogs, by the way. I had to plunk down about 100K of my own cash to get this thing started. Those are those moments where you're standing there and you slowly just put your fingers up to your neck yeah. and you're like, am I going to die? All right, welcome everybody. Today's guest is the star of Bravo's Summer House in Winter House, all the houses, <laughs> all the houses, and CEO of Lover Boy. He is the definition of work hard, play hard, and you can tell that by his body and face. Just like his <laughs> mullet, he is business in front, party in the back, and Loverboy is the destination for all of your celebratory needs, wow. right? Today, I wanna talk about how he landed a spot on Bravo Summer House. We have a Bravo connection here, how he's built a beverage empire selling nearly $40 million worth worth of these bad boys. I think I'm gonna go start a drink company right now, actually. <laughs> and what it's like running a business with friends and family. So we have the lover boy himself, Kyle Cook. Welcome to the business of influence. Hey, uh, that was a great intro. Uh, you know, the mullet really is the softball. You just knock it out of the park. You, know, you didn't always have a mullet. When did the mullet no. show up? Well, it, it, you know. When were you, it, when it was did you wake like up my... one day and you are like, babe, I have an idea. Like four months in the marriage. Okay, Whoa. perfect. You had to do it after the wedding. Yeah. I, it, the mullet was always this thing I'd grab, like an actual wig for like July 4th or just like if I wanted to be like completely outlandish. It was like my alter ego. His name was Nitro. And oh. I finally was just like, I, you know, our wedding was like three years in the making. So I just kind of kept my hair as it always was. And then, yeah, I just was like, you know what? Why don't I just become the alter ego? Just and become nitro. Yeah, I am nitro. I'm inspired. <laughs> I'm inspired. What's your alter ego? I don't know, but I'm inspired. I think I'm going to just chop a lot of this off and just go heavy on the back. There you go, buddy. I think that's the move. There you go. No one would know because you wear that yeah. stupid hat. Hey, hey, it's time. my brand, dude. Leave my hat Well, alone. You, know, you like to be unassuming. Like, I walk into a room, people are like, who is this douchebag? Yeah. And then that's when I just wall them. You only have to be a little smart to overcome a mullet. You know what? I like that a lot. Like before I met Amelia, my thing was, uh, you know, was dating is everyone would assume I was gay, right? And it was always <laughs> like, you know what? I'm just going to lean into it until it's too late. And then so they're you're like, like, wait, you're top not gay. friendly. And I'm like, <laughs> nope, not gay. And they're like, oh, but I thought, okay. And then all, now we're married and have a baby. <laughs> Kyle, I'm going to trade. Assumptions. I, I'm going to be honest with you, dude. I've never watched a single episode of Summer House. What is Summer House? Well, uh, if, if you read the description, for season one, it used the word aspirational, which is comical um, in the grand scheme of things. I'm from New Hampshire. When I thought of that, the Hamptons, I envisioned like Gatsby and like white parties and like Diddy hanging out on his yacht. Yeah. Um, but at its core, it was like a variation of what we were already doing. You know, I met some of my best friends in the Hamptons when I finally like scrounged up enough cash to, you know, have a fractional share in a house. I met some incredible people out there. And we were already doing this. We were kind of renting a house, trying to squeeze as many people in and just having the time of our lives. And I, I, I really think that it's like going out to the Hamptons every single weekend and kind of ping pong balling back and forth during the summer is like the epitome of like the New York, like work hard, play hard lifestyle. Yes. yes. And we turn it into a TV show. And, you know, you do get little glimpses of our city life, but most of the show takes place in the Hamptons and the house is rigged with, Endless amounts of surveillance cameras. Nice. So even when you take your mic off, like I'm sure you've yeah, done a thousand still, times, they still get you. They catch everything. We had no idea of season one, like the innocence of season one. Like there were mics in my headboards on my bed. Whoa. Nice. So they're thorough. <laughs> they're like, let's get it all. I'm going to install that. Now, <laughs> now you say, you know, and we turned it into a TV show. So can you just walk us through? that process? Cause I think, you know, people ask me that question all the time. They're like, oh, I want a TV show. How does it, how does it happen? Like with Million Dollar Listing, it was a open casting call right. in Times Square. Yeah. And like it was being made by a production company and they were casting real estate agents and that was it. But you had a group of friends and like kind of this idea 
I, yeah. I read somewhere too that you casted the show. Is that like- Well, well I think there's a lot of kind of anecdotes as to how the show started and it kind of takes on its own form every time I feel like, but just to like to set the record straight. So I went to an open casting call. Yeah. There was like this one man band producer that's like, let's make like the real world of Montauk. Yeah. Which Bravo would never bite into. They, they, they wanted a, a group of friends with history. And so it took a full year. Yeah. I, I you know, from my going to that initial casting call on a whim, my buddy who I actually got, just got back from Montauk for his 40th birthday, um, he'd forwarded me an email once upon a time and he said something to the effect of, if anyone's going to ruin this town forever, I want it to be you. <laughs> so go to this casting call. I want it to be Nitro. Yeah. Did you do anything crazy? Because I know you said you went to your casting call really aggressive and like gave them what they wanted. Did you do anything like I think outlandish? the funny thing for me and like my initial casting like videos, I treated it like a job interview. Like I've got an MBA, like, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm like, yo, this is, this is a job interview. And I was like, all business. And then they would interview my friends and they're like, dude, they tell me you're like the life of the party. And meanwhile, like you're all prim and proper talking, you know, business jargon in these, in these initial casting videos. So I was like, oh, good point. This is and, not a job interview. <laughs> and you, how old were you when that first happened? Uh, the initial casting call was 32. We filmed, we it took a year to kind of put the show together. And that's when I got really involved. I was like, in the slight chance that this show happens and is successful, it can be a platform. Sure. Like the only person on Bravo I knew by name was Bethany Frankel. Yeah. Ooh. And yeah, no offense. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm just like, I don't watch TV. I, I certainly don't watch reality. But, you know, this is, again, 2015, 2016. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, you can make a living on a following. Sure. It, you know, the, the idea of a platform for me was more, still more business oriented. Yeah, of course. And I was working on a nutrition app. And I'm like, what better audience? Want, you know, they, women watching Bravo want to look good, feel good. So I'm like, all right, I'll put in the time and effort to try to introduce as many friends as I can to casting. And that, and literally I knew every single person that was cast except for one who was a friend of. Got it. So I, yeah, I played like that critical role, but it's not like I was a producer. It's not like the show was my idea. I mean, there's nothing novel about doing a show in the Hamptons. It was just about finding the right group of people. And what season are you guys on now? So we, season seven's finale is, uh, on Monday. Oh, nice. Shit. We've done three seasons of Winter House. The third will air in the fall. Actually, yeah, I, third, I filmed the third show last year. I, I was on a Peacock show called The Traders. So last year was crazy. You know, on top of running Loverboy, I did three TV shows. Damn. What's, what's your what game was the Peacock up. one? It was called The Traders. It, it was like, once I got familiar with the concept, I'm like, this is TV gold. There's 20 of us. 10 people have been on TV. Yeah. 10 people have not. And at random, there are people selected to be traders and you're locked in a castle in Scotland and you have to figure out who the traders are. And every day you send someone home by majority vote. Did this show air? Yeah. It was like the number one like unscripted show on Peacock. Peacock? Like ever. Do you have Peacock? Do you. Do you? The office. They've done a nice yeah, job yeah. of like embracing digital. Have they? And like how people want to watch TV. Yeah, there's yeah. so there's so much now. It's there's crazy. So many shows. Like there's so like it's and now people you know, they'll put something on in the background and then they just pick up TikTok on their phone. You know, I, that's how my wife watches Bravo. I'm like, now I watch Bravo, right? And and I'm like, yeah, you've already seen that episode like twice. Yeah. Why, why are we watching it again? And I look over and she's on TikTok. Yeah, exactly. Something Crazy. Like yeah. So is, hold on, sorry. Is the show, is it a rotating cast or is every season the same group of friends? There, no, great question. So, I mean, Bravo always likes to tweak casts you know, every year. Yes. You've seen it. Um, we have like a, an original like core crew. There was me, two of my friends that I personally casted. And then um, now my wife, she was not casted season one, but was around. Um, and that's how we found the mic and the headboard. Nice. Uh -huh. hey. But uh, but yeah, you know, they, I think like any house in the Hamptons, you would never actually wind up with the same exact squad like year yeah. after year. People's, you know, things change, lives friendship change, change lives change. So yeah, we, you know, we kind of constantly tweak it to bring in some new faces, some 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 fresh meat. So where's the fitness app now? Because you so, got into the show, you did it, and you're like, all right. Well, I that was half the challenge. Like, it was a nutrition app. Okay. But the only way to I could try to bring it to life on camera because you're it was connecting people with a dietitian. Okay. At a fraction of the cost that it would normally if you got went it. to like their office or they came to you. But the only way to bring it to life was to do like a fitness 
event yeah. on camera and I'd like talk about nutrition and either that would get cut because yeah. it was boring or it would make it and people were like, wait, so it's a fitness app? And I'm like, God damn it. No, it's nutrition. Abs are made in the kitchen. <laughs> and calm down, Nitro. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, God damn it. Let me go get my wig. Um, so I eventually saw the writing on the wall because a, I knew alcohol is like, you know, consuming alcohol, it's like empty calories, right? The average American, 20%, this is average, not a New Yorker. Average American's caloric intake is 20% alcohol. Oh, whoa. And if you're social and having like a margarita or one of the original like hard teas, like it's probably 30, 40%. And so we saw that firsthand, like by the end of the, the, the summer in the first two seasons, I mean, we're just like bloated from partying. And... Um, you know, everybody was asking what we were drinking and half the time I'd, I'd be reluctant to tell them because I'm like, yo, full disclosure, this, this drink's horrible for you. Yeah. Like my, I had an industrial grade frozen margarita machine. You ever wonder why they don't freeze? Sugar prevents liquids from freezing. Yeah. Damn. So, so, it's so it's much disgusting. Sugar. It's disgusting. It's like diabetes. Like the show should have been called like Diabetes House. So I was like, I would watch that show. <laughs> There's probably very new, new that. pitch idea. <laughs> That's like a, T, a, a TLC type show. They have all the weird shows, like yeah. my 600 yeah. pound life, stuff like that. Yeah. That's um, not weird. It's normal. Yeah. Oh, I guess okay. it's been, okay. I guess it's been done, but, um, but no, so I, I basically put the, the, the nutrition app, you know, on the shelf and just embraced what people were interested in, which is like, what are you drinking? What's what, which rosé, what's the scoop with like the, the hard tea that you're drinking. And, and I was at this time, hard seltzers were kind of like really starting to kind of gain traction. When did you when did you kick this off? What so year? conceptualized it on season three, showed little bits and pieces of like the making of the brand, the sure. making of the product. And then we soft launched it a year later because like alcohol is super tricky. So it was like a race to get the branding done. Got it. The name trademarked and then the initial formula for filming. I've never done anything for camera unless it's related to business. Got it. Like the whole like self-producing, I'm sure you can relate. You know, a lot of, a lot of, if you watch a housewives like blow out, like you're like, wait a minute, that felt a little forced. So they self-produce. The only thing I self-produce is like, how can I get my business on the show? Sure. And so we were, we got a little bit of it in season three and then season four, we kind of filmed like the launch. And then it's, you know, it's, it's been a huge part of the show ever since. Nice. Did you go into this show thinking you're going to come up with like a product or service and like just you're going to funnel it through the show? Was that well, like? I mean, I, I thought it was going to be my nutrition app. Yeah. So it was half shits and giggles. Yeah. And it was half, this is a platform and I'm not, you know, who knows how long it's going to last. I'm not just going to sit here and think that this is it. I want to build a business. And ironically, we weren't sure we we're going to get a season three. And I had to plunk down about 100K of my own cash to get this thing started. And I had a buddy that was gonna do it with me. And he's like, dude, if you don't have season three in the bag, I don't have the confidence to do this with you. Sure. So I had to like look myself in the mirror and be like, can this brand and this product stand on its own without the platform? And I convinced myself, yes. Which also reminded me all throughout the process, the product has to stand by itself. Sure. Yeah. Like you can't put something out there and get your fans to buy it once and it sucks and they never buy it again. You need to transcend the product. Yeah. Got How do you it. even start a drink company? Because I see a lot of, there's a lot of celebrities who have their drinks now, whether it's alcohol or seltzers or teas. And like, I keep seeing these new things. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that person yeah. also. It's like the Babe Rose with like the fat Jewish, stuff like that. Yeah, right. there's lots of stuff. Well, I mean, to, to his credit, uh, to Fat Jew's credit, he did it with friends that were actually building the company. I mean, he was like the face of it. Yes. I'll, I would say 90 5% of celebrity brands are just basically the celebrity is slapped on the label for lack of a better way to put it. I mean, they're, they are not starting the company. Yeah. There's like a manufacturing warehouse. Oh yeah. That has well, not these. only that, there's an umbrella company yeah. that approaches the celebrity that approaches the influencer. Yeah. Like if people think that Logan Paul and KSI own prime, they are wrong. Well, there's that company. What is it called? It's the the same company that does that does Prime is the same company that I think works with Kim Kardashian that works with a lot. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. There's Don't a, you have a, laptop a handful. Yeah. I do have one of those laptop things. And look, to, to. you know, to their credit, it's a phenomenal idea. Like it's not like Logan Paul and KSI are going to all of a sudden figure out how to launch a beverage brand in a year. Yeah, but they can promote better than almost anybody. And the mechanics and everything that's attached yeah. to it is yeah. a it's a process. And, and what's on the flip side of that, you have big companies like an Anheuser Busch will approach, you know, some A lister, and they'll promote it, and people are like, oh, how did like Travis Scott 
come out with a seltzer that's nationwide overnight. I'm like, because it's not a seltzer. And it sucked. <laughs> Congo uh, Brands, is that it? Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to discredit what they're doing is they have another influencer that has another beverage. I mean, they're really smart guys. Yeah. But I think it's it's amazing. Like, I, I guarantee you, Logan Paul and Case I own more of that than most celebrities have in the brands that they're pushing. I think that's I, that's kind of like the essence of this podcast. I think that I think it's super interesting and we're going to see a lot more creators really monetize their audience in a way sure. by launching their own product or service in a way and I, that's, I think the the more authentic that their involvement is mm -hmm. then it's going to translate to, to more success right sure. like you won't see logan paul and ksi without prime in their hand yeah they're promoting it everywhere right you have tons of celebrities with rosés and wines and tequilas and this and that where they're but they don't have it all day every day with them they're they're just like yeah i got a tequila yeah. And it's really just like they're the face of that tequila brand. I, yeah. I don't think I've seen a photo of Logan without a prime bottle on his hand. Like yeah. he's a good example of someone pushing it. Dude, and a good example of transcending it. Like Mike, I have two kids. They're obsessed with prime. They want a prime bottle to take to school. It's fucking crazy, dude. I mean, again, it's just, it's crazy. And then they come out with an energy drink with 200 milligrams of caffeine. Hopefully they, they don't get their hands on that. <laughs> no, no, no. no. No, no, not at all. Can you imagine your kids just jacked up on caffeine? They're already like super hyper. They're so. hyper as the thing as is, like the kids. original Red Bull can had 88 milligrams of caffeine. Got it. And back in 2000 or whatever, whenever I, whenever I had my first Red Bull, I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. You know, I just got winks. Like Dude. literally the average energy drink, Celsius, what have you, is over twice that amount. Today. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I drink a lot of Bang Celsius. was 300. <laughs> it's insane. Over three times. The caffeine and Red Bull. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're moments you're standing there and you slowly just put your fingers up to your neck yeah. and you're like, am I going to die? Like, is this death you coming on me? You see your heart just being... Oh, no, your, your left arm goes numb and you're like, <laughs> dad, is is this what a heart attack feels like? Oh, yeah. I, uh, when I'll do like, when I'll go on the road to do a bunch of Loverboy events with our wholesalers, retailers, and then fans. And I do that like three days in a row where I'm literally shaking hands and hugging and kissing babies with like three, 400 people every day. By the, I mean, I'm, drinking quite a few energy drinks by then. I'm like sitting in my hotel by like day three doing exactly what you're just doing. Like yeah. doing a pulse check and you're like, yeah, that's not normal. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, can you break down? Cause I'm so, I'm so curious. The, like the day, like lover boy, where did the name come from? I know that you, and we can cut this out. We know you started out with like a, a former, a former castmate and, the, and your wife. If you want to go into that story. Yeah, no, it's I'm, not, it's not, we don't have to I'm so curious. around it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, it started with Spill the hard tea. Give me it the started hard with tea. you need a you need a name. I knew I knew I wanted to do like the first sparkling hard tea, essentially a better tasting hard seltzer. One way to add flavor to, to water without adding calories. Yeah. Hey, tea. Tea is a phenomenal. It's the literally most consumed beverage in the world. Twisted tea was like a thing back then, it's, right? It's still a thing. It's okay. Multi billion dollar brand growing twenty percent a year, but it has more sugar in it than alcohol. Oof. No. Oh. Yeah. That's not a great trade-off. And so, um, you know, back then the bar was set pretty low. Every single hard seltzer was in a white can with a weird name with no story behind it because it's coming from a bigger conglomerate. Yep. And all of the liquid kind of tasted the same. Like a black cherry hard seltzer from one brand basically tastes like a black cherry seltzer from the other because they're only using natural flavors. So I knew, I'm like, I want to use organic tea. I want to use real juice. I want to, I still want it to be, flavorful and, and a little hint of sweet. So we're going to use monk fruit, which is all natural sweetener. So we just, we were way ahead of our time because now all those things are kind of like the name of the game. Um, and uh, and so the name came from a brainstorm session with me, my girlfriend at the time, Amanda, um, and a branding agency we hired because she was working full time as a graphic designer, Yep, but was willing to help me see this brand development through because we had a basically a 10 week period where you had to build it. Where I had to build it. And, or otherwise, once green uh, season three got greenlit, I was going to miss the opportunity to get on camera. Right. Which was like, what's the point? Yeah. So, um, yeah, the name came just from me laughing out loud from a list of over 100 names. Because I'm like, can you imagine calling up an actual place of business and being like, hi, I'm Kyle from Loverboy. <laughs> and and then it was actually our second or third favorite name that we came up with, but it was um, the clearest path towards being trademarkable. Yes. Mm. And that's a, a huge part. Like you want to build up brand equity and you need a, you need a U.S. trademark. Yep. So, um, I mean, I could go on and on, but like that's so kind of how branding company helped come up with the logo and the yeah, It was idea. a collective effort. There were like six of us. Yeah. And, um, 
And yeah, Amanda worked very closely because she kind of, she was our consumer. She's nine years younger than me. She introduced me to my very first hard seltzer back in 2016. And I was just like, most, like most industries, alcohol is dominated by old white men mm -hmm. and women, meanwhile, make the vast majority of purchases. Like they control the disposable income and they're making 70% of alcohol purchases at retail. Mm. And meanwhile, how many brands actually speak to like today's and tomorrow's consumer? Sure. So I wanted it to stand out. I wanted it to be colorful. I want to be the name to be memorable. And we were going to show the making of the brand on TV. So it was just like flipping alcohol, like a quarter trillion dollar industry on its head because most brands that go nationwide have zero story or authenticity. At That's this so, point. so important. So then how'd you go into then making the actual product? Who makes the cans? Like, where do you... How many did you make in the first run? Yeah. One sec. Does it taste good? You're yeah, probably the wrong person to ask. One? Can I, can I? This is the He's one my of, boss, so Brian, don't little, look. It's not like you work hard anyway, so sure, uh, drink it up. Crack? I'm channeling my inner Kyle at the moment. Uh, I will crack. All right, let's do it. So, do don't mean to cut ASMR you off. For those of you watching, it's five o'clock somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cheers. So this, so this is like, this is where it kind of all starts. This is the lemon iced tea. It could be colder. Honest opinion. It's good. It's good. It's it. This is like a, it's supposed to be sessionable. It's not too fruity. It's not too sweet. If you want like an alternative to like a fruit or seltzer, we have like a peach. We have a hibiscus. We have a strawberry lemonade. But um, this is the monk fruit. Or they all have monk fruit. They all in a little them. touch of monk fruit to. So this like, is the lemon iced tea one. Yeah. Kiss nice. with ginger. How many flavors do you have? At this point, we have eight hard teas. We have soon to be five spritz because we we launched a direct to consumer line. And then we have two um, uh, martinis, two cocktails. Got it. So I wasn't counting, but I think that's something like 13, 15. So the first, so you put $100,000 in, right? Building brand, building everything. The first creation, like how many how many cans did yeah, you Yeah, so we first, came out with three, What do you say? First three blue, flavors. first prints, like how many? Four, it's like a, you, Kate not to Kate's. sound like a lab because we're using all like natural ingredients, but you basically formulate. Okay. So I had to find a guy. And I found a guy. He was literally in his Brooklyn hipster apartment. Um, I found him on the web. Just like mixing potions. Yeah, literally, li literally like some like, you know, doctor of, you know, beverage. Sure. And um, I came in with the concept. I'm like, it's got to be zero sugar. I think that's a huge point of differentiation in non-alk and soon it should be in alk. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be using high quality ingredients. Um, and so I came in with the idea of like the profile. And then we worked for you know, months to try to like fine tune it, tweak it and get it to a place where, all right, I'm going to take about 2000 cans, fill them, um, using that, you know, part of that hundred K and get it on the show, get my friends feedback, get some of that product placement and start talking about the challenges of, of building the brand. And, and look, this was like a fully functioning company. This is where like a lot of housewives go wrong. They take a, they Tell take them what they're doing wrong. They take someone's wine. They slap their name on it. and wonder why it's not selling. I'm like, sure. well, what are we buying into here? Same thing with tequila. Like, what's her name? Kendall Jenner that came out with A1A? Oh, yeah. she got shit on that A1A. Well, the, the, the distillery she that- still, She promotes it a lot. Like, the distillery that did her tequila does 60 other brands. Yeah. Where the hell is the story there? Just because she hopped on a horse and went through like an agave field. That was a cool image though. It was well, a people, great image that people got are, ridiculed. Yeah, she get people are mad. On a horse. And yeah, go she should have gotten nude. She should have gotten nude. Um, <laughs> but I think, uh, you know, Showing the trials and tribulations lends itself to people rooting for you and they're, they're more curious to check it out. And so we were able to get enough on it for season three. But then I had to take that formula from that Brooklyn apartment and bring it to an actual lab in New Jersey and, and, and make it like something that could be actually manufactured and scaled. So are these, it's every single can of Loverboy made in the US? Yeah. yeah. Are they made in New Jersey? No, these are now made in Pennsylvania and or Wisconsin. So how many people work for you now? So I have 20, we have a, there are 26 employees starting on, on Monday. You have 26 starting this Monday? No, sorry, the 26th. Oh, yeah, the yeah. 26th. If I, was, if I had 26 so, people join, I think things would be uh, <laughs> popping dude, off. That's, you a, have, that's an aggressive Monday. You have a team. Two of them are dogs, by the way, and which those, I think that, is that super cute. That has been updated, but, um, but yeah, the- Is that because they just look weird? And so you made Well, them, the crazy thing is we have- Technically, thousands of people selling Loverboy because what I ha then had to do is go out and bring on distributors that were bought into the product because alcohol is really tricky. There's some 
archaic laws that go back to prohibition. I'm legally required to sell to a wholesaler who then sells to the retailer. I, if Whole Foods wants to take me nationwide, it's a lot harder than like any other category in consumer packaged goods because I need a wholesaler for every Whole Foods location. You basically need a broker, right? For lack of a better way to put it, yeah. 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 Um, and so those wholesalers, also known as distributors, you know, kind of act as the middlemen. And um, that's the tricky part in alcohol, to be to be frank. They don't quite understand what the consumer wants. They have zero interaction with the consumer. So you just, you run around all day long now and make relationships with wholesalers. Yeah, like we have to cover, I mean, we're in probably 90% of the country right now in terms of population. We have about 180 distributors and they have their own sales teams that my team of market managers educates and tries to you know keep our brand top of mind. So, you know, in, in theory, if we leverage their sales teams, that's yeah. where you factor in like, yeah, we have like thousands of people technically in a position to sell Loverboy. Who's your biggest competition? Like people will buy Loverboy or? Spike T or what is it? Yeah, I mean, what we've done to the category is we've grown. If, if you want to look at our first product, which is a sparkling hard tea, we weren't going off after like the, the, the current hard tea consumer because that's people drinking a lot of sugar and they don't really care about a better for you product. We were looking to, grow the tea market and upsell people from like hard seltzer or, or bring people over from wine and spirits. Sure. We can sell this product in four times the retail locations than a spirit-based product. But meanwhile, we appeal to a consumer that oftentimes will be buying wine and spirits, but now they can find it at their local grocery store. Got it. So we've built like this kind of premium brand that has better tax and distribution advantages. So what's, what's the consumption like? Like what are the... What are well, the, personally, what? I drink about 100 a week. No, I'm just kidding. Got it. <laughs> Let's go. That's why I sell so much. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, in terms of like purchases, sales, like how, yeah, do you, so, how do you, how would, I mean, other than dollars rolling sure. in, like how, how well, do you- Well, we, we knew we wanted to be where the consumer is. So early on, while we're build, d- building out this network of beer wholesalers, yeah, which was going to take a while, particularly in, in COVID, we built out a direct to consumer direct to consumer channel where we could sell our spritz and cocktails online, like okay. true DTC, skipping over the wholesaler and retailer legally. And um, that business took off because ironically, we launched our first spritz in April of 2020 when everybody was home. Oh, and they uh, just wanted to just yeah. drink hard, what sexy are the, tea. Yeah. What are the legalities of like, how do you verify if someone's over 21 buying? Do you have to like- They just sign a, for it. Uh, yeah, oh, there's okay, a whole okay, third okay, party yeah. kind of takes on that legal risk. But- um. We just wanted to be where the consumer is. We knew we had a fan base. We knew it was going to take time to get it at their local retailer. So we came out with our direct to consumer product. We also ran out of these cans. In 2020, there was this huge can crunch. Yeah. Like literally a can shortage. Supply chain. Supply chain. It was wild. Supply. This was <laughs> exasperated by, by COVID, but not even due to COVID because it happened a couple months into COVID. So the, in 2020, the US beverage industry was 10 billion cans short of demand, which is people crazy. People drink a lot in this country. Yeah. So I was importing empty cans from Shanghai and, and cleaning them. Poor. No, whoa. No, you 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 technically get these printed at Got the can it. manufacturer. Got it. But you couldn't get domestic cans for like twelve to eighteen months. So I had to figure out, you know, how to source those things from overseas. Then they got stuck off the coast during the freight yeah. and cargo fiasco. I mean, COVID put our business through every single possible test. But when you look at it over the last three years. 25% of our revenues from DTC. Okay. Of which almost half is merch. Interesting. So, yeah, we've sold like $5 million worth of merch. That was my next question. So I see that there's like a huge shirts, section, towels. Yes. The way you really, I mean, you're not a lifestyle brand unless you're selling merch, in my sure. opinion. Um, and we really wanted to create this premium lifestyle brand that wasn't stuck in a category like beer, wine, or spirits. We have products in multiple categories now. People are not about like, well, what's, what's the alcohol? They're about the taste, they're about the brand, they're about the, the nutrition facts. How it looks holding in their hands. Exactly, how Instagrammable it is. Like our spritz have gold foil, they look beautiful. Amanda did such a great job. But, um, but yeah, when it all shakes out, you know, when, on, the, on the retail side of the business, we kind of look at volume in terms of cases. So a case has 24 cans. So we track like, how much are we selling to wholesalers? How much are wholesalers selling to retailers? It's a very convoluted industry. We have to buy all sorts of data to understand the trends. And then obviously direct to consumers are a lot more straightforward. We, sure. we own all that data. 
Got it. I wonder, like, what is the percentage of people who are buying the cans and then like buying a towel with it? Like, is there is is there like a huge conversion of like a product with drink? Well, ironic. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, again, most of our business is through retail, but when you look at the online business, one of the reasons we were trying to figure out what to do in terms of like our Shopify relationship is because legally we had to sell the alcohol in a, a completely different checkout than the merch. Wow. Right. And so you couldn't kind of, um, what do you call it? Um, bundle. Um, but there is a huge overlap with the people that are buying, you know, the alcohol and the merch. Is yeah. that the way it is today? You got to buy them separately? Uh, we, we finally figured that out. Yeah, it was a couple hundred K, but uh, <laughs> got you, it. <laughs> you, you started the company with a handful of friends and now wife? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's one thing that I'll stress. Like I've talked about like, you know, the business of influence in the sense that like, if you're just slapping your name on something, you're, you know, I don't care how big of a celebrity you are. Like literally there's celebrities with tens of millions of followers and the brands that they push have less than 50,000 followers. Like how does that even translate? Mm -hmm. And so for us, first of all, Summerhouse presented this insane product placement opportunity. Like I don't think there's other, there's been another brand that has been featured as many times, like ever. If you, if you, like one of our, one of my colleagues counted how many times you saw a lover boy can in one episode, I think it was 70 times. And so, um, that's partly because so much of the footage happens in the house. Yeah. But it's also because it's not just product placement. Like from the get go, I was working with my girlfriend, then fiance, then wife. I convinced her to quit her job as a graphic designer in corporate America and join me. And one of my best friends who happened to be on the show from the day, from day one, Carl, um, not only wanted to invest when I was raising money from friends and family, he was like, yo, like I'm a sales guy. Like, how do I become your first sales rep essentially? And I was just like, I mean, yeah, you get the product. You're a huge- Pick up the phone and start dying. Yeah. So, I mean, he was literally pounding the pavement here in New York city when we, when we soft launched in like the fall of 19. And um, yeah, you know, that, that little glimpse into three of us, three of the four original cast members working on something together yeah. helped kind of build the momentum, yeah. the loyalty to the brand, people's curiosity, like how does it taste? So working with friends and family, I, I can't imagine it being easy. I know. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take a sip of my lover boy on that topic. <laughs> I just, I, I, I don't know. I've seen, I've seen it go really South really fast. I don't know. Would you work? I mean, I don't know if you want to. No, we don't, I don't. I don't ever work with friends or family. I, I don't want to work with anyone that I can't fire. <laughs> right like that's it's be really hard to Sweet. work with someone you can like, <laughs> but, like, you know oh, i God. think but how tough is it like to go back home to amelia and like try to like have her relate to what you're going to through at work and like i guess like maybe that's how you distance yourself from work you're like yeah i'm just not going to talk about my work day yeah like kind of like i don't i think our you know my, my work is very different like our, our days are incredibly stressful yeah and it's there's a lot that goes on and happens between the businesses like the last thing i want to do at night is like bring even more of that home like i already yeah. have work i got to do when i get home so yeah. it's nice to have somebody who like you know like amelia is a trained maritime attorney right um uh and i did not know this uh, <laughs> but know this now um that maritime law is what is used in space now so maritime law is now space law because how else are you gonna govern makes sense. like the space above the earth? And so how many people out there are currently domestically located who have maritime law degrees and have done it in the UK and in Athens, Greece, and for major shipping container lines here in the United States, like not that many, like right. that's a super unique conversation for me to have as she talks about like her work and stuff. And then me coming home and being like, all right, do we do that inspection or that walkthrough or that this or that that? It's like, oh God. How do yeah. you balance it? I mean, look, I think. How many wives do you have? You, have? you only have one for now? <laughs> for now. Rookie yeah, yeah. numbers. I think, um, I mean, look, I think early on, particularly in the pandemic, it was great to have someone there for like the highs and the lows. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know how far along your business was when you met your wife, but um, I think that's part of the challenge of being like a solo founder. Like, yeah. yeah by yourself. Yeah. You know, and so I, I very early on brought a COO, but but to your question, I mean, up until recently, I made two senior hires and I finally had a breath of fresh air. I mean, I didn't go on a vacation for four years. Oof. I had zero boundaries. The stresses, I mean, we had um, these cash flow cycles that were getting extended because of the supply chain challenges. Um, to your stock and inventory. And then yeah, like I mean, it was like a classic, 
mean, this is why I didn't want to go into an inventory business back when one of my best friends asked me to join bird dogs. I was just like, that sounds like a nightmare. And you, you can literally go out of business because you couldn't keep up with demand. Yeah. Like that is insane to me. And so, I mean, we were in multiple of those situations in 2020 in the thick of the pandemic, we literally had to buy time due to the people that we owed money. Otherwise, like on paper, we were in the red. Yeah. And um, so yeah, it was insanely stressful. And we just, I had, I was working, you know, 18 hour days, seven days a week. And um, yeah, like I just barely kind of picked my head up. And, you know, for me, you know, working with a man, it's it, not, not gonna lie. I mean, it, I think season four was probably at its peak because she was still working a corporate, she went four seasons on Bravo holding down a corporate nine to five. Yeah. And meanwhile, I was expecting her to come home from work and work on Loverboy. Yeah. And I still regret it to this day. I called her lazy. And to this day, fans Ooh. call her lazy. But I'm like, yo, she's filming a show. She's working a full-time job. And I'm giving her a hard time by not wanting to jump at the at the opportunity to like work when you come home from work. <laughs> hey, this sounds like a man who's been through some couples counseling right yeah. there. That is some a, strong words. <laughs> Dude, so what, what did you think at, when you were 18, what did you think you were gonna be? Like, what did you wanna do? I, I first started touring colleges because I thought I wanted to be an architect. Okay. I actually always loved real estate. Moved to the city for a commercial, commercial real estate finance startup in 07. And obviously that got interesting with the the economy. Yep. Um, but yeah, I've always just kind of, you know, I went from thinking I was going to be an architect to a mechanical engineer to poli sci because then I realized engineering was really hard yes. in college. Um, I then, but you know, all the while I've always kind of been entrepreneurial. Yeah. So like I sold Cutco knives from 20 to age 22. I ran a painting franchise where I would, I had 50 people working for me painting homes in New Hampshire. So you've always been yeah, entrepreneurial. Yeah, always. I've, I've worked one year of corporate America and yeah. I set like a rookie record for a Fortune 100 company and went into my boss's office and quit. And he's like, what the hell? It's the last thing I saw coming. I'm like, yeah, I, it's not for me. <laughs> yeah. He's like, you just set the rookie record for a 200 year old company. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm out. <laughs> there you go. Jeez. And then so you went to Trinity and then you went to Babson, Babson. Yeah. right? So when the world was melting down and the real estate gig, like my buddy wanted to move the business to- so like um, 08, 09. Yeah, I mean, it was brutal. Like I was just hemorrhaging cash. None of us were taking a salary. Yeah. Um, and they were gonna move the business to Scottsdale. And I was just like, you know, back then I was like, what are you, retire retiring? Are you trying to play golf? Like I'm not moving to Arizona. Yeah. That's like, where you go if you have allergies. Yeah. <laughs> so- um, My parents were there, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a great place to go. It's so hot. But again, like you retire there. Yeah. So, I mean, now Scottsdale's cool, but anyway, I was just having this real identity crisis. Like what I, I thought I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I thought I wanted to be in real estate. And my, uh, my cousin, who was a really smart woman, she like went to HBS and um, was a venture capitalist. She's just like, Kyle, if you want to do startups and you want to be an entrepreneur, but you don't know what you want to do, go to Babson. It's the number one school for entrepreneurship and do a reset. It's exactly what I did from 09 to 11, did a reset, started interning at like tech startups, came out of Babson to, to launch my first tech startup, which was like a total nightmare. Classic example of like, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but you gotta you learn know, on the job, man. You gotta swing and miss. Failing upwards, as they say. What did you learn in getting your MBA that has proven to be super beneficial to launching Loverboy? I think I a lot of people that, that watch too, or you know, like today, most 16, 17 year olds are not thinking college anymore, right. not, let alone like an MBA, right. right? And then they see things like what you're doing here and they're like, dude, all I gotta do so I can get a mullet Right, get a bunch of my bros together and we're gonna do, you know, Hilton Head House. And then I'm gonna create, you know, a beer that has 600% alcohol and it's totally gonna be different. <laughs> and then there we go. But like, you actually have an MBA. Yeah, yeah, I think, I, I joke, but I, I think I'm one of the few people on Bravo that like has their graduate degree and like, you know, thought they were definitely gonna do things a little differently. And the TV thing was by accident. But like, you know, when I when I went to, to business school, I think it was a little bit of a different era. Yeah. You know, I wasn't, I was like, I want to start something, but you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind having like a six figure job when I graduate and like some security and some safety. But like, again, I was like, well, what do I want to do? 
And um, I ended up, you know, continuing on the entrepreneurial path. Um, you know, look, I, you don't have to go to business school, obviously, to, to, to start a business. And it's a very expensive two years. Yeah. But, and you don't even have to go to college, right? But I think you have to find ways to chalk up real learning lessons. You know, I think actually putting in time and going to work for another company and like trying to climb the goddamn ladder to understand how most of America makes a living, I think is important. You know, I think a lot of young people like, again, they think they know, but there's like, they don't even know what they don't know in yeah. reality. Yeah. And so finding ways like learn from your, your mistakes and, but you only learn from your mistakes if you have learning lessons. And so you have to just one way or the other, put yourself out there because chances are, I mean, like the, I think the, Z the Mark Zuckerberg's and the Elon Musk, the world have like distorted the reality of being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You don't hit a grand slam your, at your first at bat, right? Like, you know, you got to put in real hard work. There's a good chance you're going to fail. And that's when the real entrepreneurs are made. Do you give in and go take a job somewhere or do you take another stab at it? And I've taken many stabs at it. Like I've probably had more businesses either fail or never even launch than I've, had successful businesses. So I, for me, I think you just have to find ways to like learn the hard way. And also I think one of the big takeaways is just doing something you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. A couple of my startups that were tech based out of business school, I was following trends, mm -hmm. like yeah. the Uber for this, Uber for that, on demand this, on demand that. Like, and man, what I really enjoyed about Loverboy was like, it's a tangible functional beverage, gives you a buzz. Uh, yeah, it does. What does the next five years look like for, for Loverboy? Just so, going to ask that question. Yeah, so we, um, Same brain. we're still looking to fill distribution gaps, right? Like when it's all said and done with, we'll have well over 200 distributors. Um, we're still in single digit uh, distribution penetration. In, in other words, like of all the buying accounts in the US, they can sell our products. We're in like five or 6%. Yeah. So like, we're still like, it's like blue ocean. So there's so much opportunity. Um, we have a lot of momentum behind us and it's really just trying to build the best brand possible. Like I want the vast majority of people drinking a lover boy to have no idea who I am because they discovered it through their friend who discovered who their, through their friend who watches summer house. Sure. You know what I mean? So for me, it's just really about building a world-class brand that can stand the test of time. And, you know, I've, I've been tempted, like, look, the big companies have come knocking, but like they have a track record of buying a brand and ruining it. Yeah. So like, that's not enticing. It's mm. too soon. Yeah, it's too soon. If I'm in five, 6% of accounts that I could be in and like in one big retail deal that I'll hope to like announce this fall, I could double that yeah. with one relationship. Yeah. Like, I feel like we're just getting started. So- does it make sense to do like collaborations with like big per personalities? Like, I guess the only reference I have is like the Nelk boys just did that happy dad collab with Snoop Dogg and they're pushing out their death row collab. And it's like the one flavor. Yeah. I think those guys are brilliant because like at the end of the day, similar to Logan Paul, like their day to day is content creation. Mm -hmm. They've got guys. It's actually these two brothers that run the company. The Shady brothers. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant guys. Uh, I think I met one of them at a conference I was speaking at, but I don't even think I knew the happy dad story at that time. Um, I think it, it'll, it I think that'll be an interesting case study to see if it works. Right. Like Snoop Dogg, I think what they did was really on brand mm -hmm. and it f works and you can tell Snoop's all in on it. Yep. Um, you see, like I said, most collabs do not work. Mm -hmm. They don't really go anywhere. Um, and, and But most people don't know that because yeah. they're not sharing all the it's like oh yeah we did this but like it didn't sell anything um if i can find the right you know a lister since i'm like a d e or f that you're like a good e i'll go with e um C, D. if we can find someone that like really enjoys our product that wants to create their own flavor and we can kind of document that process yeah and share what it's like to launch something new then I'm all over it. Um, I'm actually talking to, you know, some some like talent managers about that very idea wow. because I'd love to, you know, be building the brand outside of our current audience. Sure. And, you know, there's obviously tons of ways to do that. But. Yeah. And there's a lot of those, those celebrities are, you know, major, major influencers who do like equity for trade. 
deals yep. who are in it. You know, that's a lot of kind of what you what you see. Um, there's some brands that we're involved in right now that are doing the same thing with. with yeah, I think the sweet cool spot is if you get them to invest, and then you you basically lay on top some equity to basically sure. make it like give them twice the skin in the game, but they actually have some cold hard cash too. I think yeah. that's critical. Um, you know, so if we were like doing a round, mm. that's when I would like look to people that could kind of complement our existing fan base and, and customer base. Nice. I want to pitch you on something. Hit me. Uh, on social. Ready for this? And I'll invoice your creative team. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, it's a social strategy. Do more. Yeah, do more. Yeah. I think Loverboy on social needs a dating show sponsored by Loverboy. And I think you should like do these very vertical forward um, or like how well do you know your partner type thing? Like those like man on the street type yeah. things. Well, I like these ideas. We have, we've had some internal conversations about something similar because again, I didn't have, I don't even have time to create content on my own Instagram, which I know is a pathetic excuse. If you can figure it out, I'm pointing to Ryan for the people listening. Like if you can figure it out, it's like 12 people in this. I room. can figure it out. Yeah. I mean, you guys are like the team I'm guessing. So we know we, we need to be doing better. Like we need to be doing better on TikTok. We don't even have a YouTube channel. Like, you know, I personally need to be putting myself out there and showing the behind the scenes. You know, we, we kind of get lazy sometimes because we film so much that doesn't make it. Yeah. So we show some of the, 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 the hard work that we're putting in. No, it's hard to do like, both. Yeah. And, and it's just a like, lot. If I have the big cameras from Bravo there, I'm not, I don't have my team there either. Sure. So in retrospect, I should. I'm like, yo, you guys are just gonna have twice the cameras in the room. Um, but yeah, I think I love that idea. Cause like, I mean, again, we chose a cheeky, memorable name that has yeah. so many different meanings for people. Yeah. And it, and like we've sponsored like dating apps and, and things like that. And I think that that's like a, a no brainer, but doing our own show. Like like a really low lift version of it, I think works on social. Even like coming up to like couples, I think like at Washington Square Park, and it's like, all right, for a case of lover boy, how well do you think you know your whatever? And then like give the girlfriend like a little whiteboard and like ask the boyfriend like, all right, what's yeah your mom's favorite color? I like it. Or what's I mean, I get kind of drilled with games like that all the time since we're like co cast members. There you go. You know, we'll we'll play a lot of like games for sure. wh right. whoever's like interviewing us but all right in, in um, we're doing like just, live just, streaming just, sessions that are like lover boy live yeah. you know because i think that's that's where if you especially look at the younger generation that might not be drinking this just yet but they are like it's everything is moving more and more and more into mobile yeah. away from cable away from streaming oh yeah and, more and into we like we want to tune into wednesdays at eight on my phone like the fewer taps that i yeah, have to do yeah. is a pain in the ass to pick up a remote to turn on the thing to do that oh i know and yeah. I mean, you look at even just how people watch TV now. It's, I mean, NBC Universal, like which owns Bravo, which is owned by Comcast, right? Like they have to have their own proprietary way to aggregate all the streams. Like yeah. Nielsen is worthless. Yeah. Like, cause no one's watching live. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. I feel like I'm finding all my new shows or my new movies or even old movies because I see a clip of it on like TikTok. Yeah. I mean, we literally watched a movie on Sunday when I got back from um, my buddy's birthday party. And Amanda's like, yeah, I saw this on TikTok. Here we go. Yeah. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but that clip. Yeah, she's great. like, it's got three, it's got four stars by like 3,000 people. I mean, yeah, but like where? Yeah. I mean, let's just talk about that because it was actually the worst waste of time of my life. <laughs> there you go. I'm there like, all right, go. I just want to unplug, put some quality entertainment on. And it was, I'm like, oh no, it's one of those, like a Netflix movie where they just run out of money and then like, it just ends. Yeah. It's like, what the hell did I just watch? Or it's a Netflix movie or, or another movie where they had just too much money and they're like, just go make a movie. Just you yeah. two, three pretty people you put in the room. Just, it's uh, three hours, but it should have been two. Just fight. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, what am I What am I going through right now? Did you see that Jonah Hill thing about his, uh, his therapist? therapist? Yeah. Yeah, that I thought was interesting. That's just like Netflix. Like, I don't know what to do with this, you know, four million. Just do something with it. I guess it was good. I missed it was, that. Did you see it? Wait, with... Dude, there's 6,000 shows every day now. Yeah. Like, wow. Even when like... When our show started, it was on the precipice of like content overload, right? Like yeah. back in 2015, 2016, like Amazon, Hulu, I mean, maybe Netflix with like House of Cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was very- Yeah, everything changed right it, around yeah, that Everyone point. became a content creator. And I'm not talking like, you know, individuals here. I'm talking about like any type of entertainment entity was like, yeah. we got to create our own content. Yeah. It's insane. 
It's insane. Jesus. I feel right, lucky dude. that our show has stood the test of time and then we got the spinoff. I mean, honestly, I think Winter House was a, a pandemic baby. Yeah. I mean, Bravo was trying to figure out, well, we just filmed season five of Summer House in lockdown, in a bubble. What else could we do? And I'm like, well, I pitched Winter House like two years ago. Let's do that. Yeah. My last question, how do, how do I get an invite to one of these parties you throw it in? Just stay in the loop, bro. Okay. You know? <laughs> you got you to gotta, uh, get your ass out to the Hamptons. You uh, get time are you guys shooting, shooting this summer? Or do you not? We, you know, you know how they work. They're like very mysterious. I, I'd like to think so. We yeah. had a little bit of a weird season seven, candidly. Um, do you have a house set for the summer? Because like they always... We just took down our Hamptons house yesterday. I always wait to the last minute. Um, it's been a weird market, but like yeah. you just squeeze one in there. Well, I, th I mean, it's an even weirder market when there's like a filming permit required yeah, 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 and, yeah, and yeah, like the house sure. has to be suitable for not only the cast, but the but crew. The crew it's got to be big enough. Yeah, so I think in the in the past, I believe the production company has to lock that house without even knowing we're greenlit. Yeah. Because you will lose that opportunity. Yep. Yeah. Where are you, you going to stay? In Bridge. Our nice. office is in Bridge. Yeah. And a lot of the deals we do are kind of in that range. So it, it makes it helpful for us to not have to deal with all of that traffic. Yeah. So like we're already there. Cool. Yeah, it's nice. Invoice generator. Who do I send this invoice to? <laughs> yeah, just chat GPT <laughs> an invoice over to me. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> well, cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. Founder Thank of Loverboy here. Thanks for sitting down with us in the business of influence. Thanks Appreciate for it. diving into the dirty details. Absolutely. And showing Actually, I, should, I should note, Ryan gave me some great advice very early on. I did? Which I was like, Whoa. oh. I don't care what Ryan's asking. I'm coming into the office. I'll do whatever. You, you told me not to get a manager too early on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was like, we got connected yeah, with like a mutual like first friend. started and we yeah. connected, yeah. I was like trying to think how I negotiate season two. He's like, dude, it's an ensemble cast. Don't think you're going to get more than other people. Yeah. You're probably going to negotiate on behalf of your cast. And that's yeah. exactly what I've been doing. Yeah, team so up. So you gave me some great advice. So I appreciate that. What's up, bro? There we go. Full circle. I want one. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, dude. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Of course.